Hi, I'm Lisa Turkhurst, and this is Dr. Joel Mutamale. We're the co-authors of Seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. And this week, we're going to be talking about week four, which is provisions. And I really want to focus in on seeing Jesus when your prayers go unanswered, or it seems they're going unanswered. And it kind of feels like at times this question would pop up. Is God really going to be there? Is Jesus really going to provide mm. the what I need or whatever it is that I'm praying for? And Joel, I know that we keep going back to Genesis, and this week's going to be no exception, again, because we want to see where are some of the first times that we see Jesus in the Old Testament providing and coming through for us. Yeah. So one of the things that we know about Jesus, and, and we'll look at this more this week, is that um, Jesus is our faithful prophet, priest, and king. Now, Lisa, I know one of your favorite passages of Scripture is definitely Genesis chapters 1 and 2, mm -hmm. but also Hebrews chapter 2. What, what is it about Hebrews 2 that you love about Jesus? I love in Hebrews chapter 2 where we are absolutely assured that Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest because it, it, it gives this indication that, yes, Jesus came to make atonement for our sins, but, but he also came to lead us mercifully and faithfully as our high priest, but not a high priest that we can't identify with. Right. We can 100% identify with him because he identifies with us. He was made fully human in every way. We've already read this from Hebrews chapter 2 before, but I think his role as a merciful and faithful high priest is one that lets us know he is there for us and he is leading us, not absent of the knowledge of what it feels like to be human, but very much having experienced humanity for himself. So one of the things about a high priest, the way that the priest would function in the Old Testament and, um, and elsewhere, is that the priest would come on behalf of the people of God. Uh, in a way, the priest would be the one who would pray all the prayers to God. He would intercede on behalf of the people to God. And so the high priest, one time a year, would go into the Holy of Holies and do this thing um, called the, sac the atonement sacrifice, where um, the, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies and plead on behalf of all of Israel for God to show kindness and mercy. Um, Jesus is the greater high priest. But here's what's so interesting. The first picture or the first image or the first reality mm -hmm. of a faithful um, or a priest, prophet, king is actually, guess where? In Genesis, <laughs> in Gen because it's the role that God assigned to Adam and Eve. That's right. Yeah. So if you go to Genesis chapter 2, um, th there's a lot here. One is in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, 1 verses 26 uh, God says let us make man in our image the Hebrew word is shalem and after our likeness another Hebrew word demut and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth 27 so God created man in his own image in mm. the image of God he created him male and female he created him the reason why I highlighted those two words image and likeness is because those are two words that are used all throughout the ancient world to describe a royal king who would have children mm. and those children would reflect the image and likeness of the king. So what we have is a picture of royalty. Adam and Eve are royal children of the king of heaven and earth. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Every member of a royal household, actually, honestly, every member of any household, Lee's, has responsibilities. My kids have chores. It's amazing. Well, when they actually do their chores. Right. <laughs> but here in verse 15, God gives Adam and Eve responsibilities. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. If you're a highlighting, underlining type of uh, gal, you might want to go ahead and circle that keep it. The Hebrew word there is shamar. Here's what's so interesting. This is the exact same word that's used in 1 Chronicles 9.23 of the priests who were to guard the temple. Also, uh, in Nehemiah 11.19, of the gatekeepers who were supposed to guard the city uh, limits. So, in other words, we could say that God put Adam and Eve in Eden, not just to cultivate the garden, 
not just to flower all the plants and to maintain what's taking place, is that in mind for sure. But there's another nuance. There's this other understanding that they were there to protect the garden. Right. They were supposed to keep anything bad from coming in and disrupting the peace, the shalom that was present inside of Eden. And I think it's also important to ask this question. How do we know that Adam and Eve were assigned the specific role, what we're about to get to, of high priest? How do we know that, that they were, as they are to take care of the garden? Well, I think it points to the reality that the presence of God was there. That's right. Therefore, if we look at what unfolds later as where we see the presence of God, it's often in the Holy of Holies, which is where the high priest had to go in. So I, I see this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden being almost like this Holy of Holies. It was like, I know some scholars even call it the Temple, Temple Garden, garden mm -hmm. right? And so Adam and Eve were assigned the roles of protecting it, just like the high priest would have protected the Holy of Holies. Absolutely. And it's, it's in this place, the fact that, as we know, Adam and Eve, um, they do let evil in, they do let sin in, and they let the serpent um, tempt them, that this is the place that created the separation. We've talked about this earlier in earlier weeks, that created the separation between God and man. And once the separation um, made its way into the relationship between God and man, this is where prayer was introduced. Mm -hmm. Prayer was now the conduit of being able, in the past they were just able to talk to God, just like you and I are talking right now, Lisa. But after this, they would pray prayers. And then there was this feeling of, gosh, are my prayers answered? God, are you listening? God, mm -hmm. are you hearing? And this is where Jesus is the faithful prophet priest and king. He takes us back to that Edenic state, that Edenic vision of Adam and And when you and say Eve, Edenic, you mean the, the garden, time of the, the Garden, garden of, of Eden. Eden. Yeah. yeah. Um, that that re resembles and represents a time where we walk and talk with God himself. And we didn't need to go through another man, a high priest or a priest, in order to talk to God. Like we had a direct connection with God himself and Jesus provides that direct connection again. Absolutely. And so I just find this completely fascinating. You know, Joel, I want to end today by telling a story of um, a time that I was really wondering, Jesus, are you protecting me? Are you going to be there for me? Um, is your presence even seen in my life right now? Are you being a merciful and faithful high priest? Mm. Because I was feeling like I was crying out in absolute desperation, but not seeing an answer from the Lord. And it was when I, I had had some issues, um, just a lot of deep emotional turmoil, and it started to play out in these unexplainable, really terrible stomach aches. Eventually, the pain got so intense one morning that I woke up and it wasn't even possible for me to stand up. Mm. I mean, I was just, I collapsed from the pain. So my family rushed me to, through the, to the hospital, to the emergency room, and they started running tests and they didn't see, they couldn't immediately find out what was wrong with me. But because I was in so much pain, they admitted me to the hospital and they kept running tests. While I was there Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the only reason that the doctors didn't send me home was because of the pain. Otherwise, they kept running tests and the tests kept, kept coming back negative. Until Friday morning, a surgeon happened to be at this hospital and got my case looked at it and said, I want to run one more test. He ran one more test, a CT scan with contrast. And when he did that, he realized why I was in so much pain and it had been missed before. My colon had literally ripped away from the abdominal wall, twisted around mm. itself and cut off the blood flow inside of me. And as the doctor came in and explained the results of that last test to me, 
He said, Lisa, we have to rush you into emergency surgery and we're going to have to remove most of your colon. And I remember him then saying, Lisa, I know you've been in a lot of pain and I know you've been asking for the pain to go away, for God to take away your pain. But I just want you to know, Lisa, if God would have answered that prayer, then we would have sent you home because we, it was only the pain that kept you here. And if we would have sent you home, your colon would have ruptured and you probably would have died in your sleep. And as the surgeon walked out, I suddenly realized God was answering a greater prayer than what I even knew to pray. Yeah. I was asking God to take away the pain. God was answering the prayer to save my life. Wow. And he left the pain and the pain wound up being the very thing that kept me in the hospital and that provided a way for me to get the surgery that I desperately need. And mm. so I know I said this before, but today I wanna close and I wanna say this again. Truly, God loves us too much to answer our prayer at any other time than the right time and in any other way than the right way. And as you study Jesus this week, seeing Jesus through the different provisions in the Old Testament, I hope you remember, even if it doesn't look like he's providing for you in the way you think he should today, maybe he's giving you a greater answer, a greater provision you didn't even know to ask for.